Well, let's begin. So good afternoon. And on behalf of our principal investigator, Dr. Linda Goggin, and myself, welcome to the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center's Office Hours Running Series. Today's topic will focus on peer drift and the family peer specialist workforce. I'm Gail Cormier, the project director of NASTAC, the Family Center of Excellence, and we are led by the National Federation of Families. This month's Office Hours series is designed with the family workforce in mind, preparing the family peer workforce for systems transformation and authentic family partnership. We'll focus on supporting the family peer workforce. Each month, a subject matter expert, usually a family peer specialist, will introduce one of the five core competencies for family peer specialists. This month, I am excited to tell you I'm the guest presenter. So we'll, we are going to have a great conversation. Before we start our interactive conversation today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's conversation is being recorded. The recording and any additional resources will be uploaded to our NASTAC website under the events tab. And we'll also send you a follow-up email. If you have any technical difficulties, please type your comment and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenter in the chat box and we'll be watching the chat during the entire presentation. And if you know me by now, I love a conversation. So please, when I finish presenting, take your mics off, put your cameras on and ask questions. And, and if you want, you can put them in the chat, but I'd love to hear your voices and see your faces. Our goal for office hours is to encourage a conversation between our guest presenters, me, and those in attendance. We encourage you to ask questions that will assist, assist you in your daily work. We will unmute participants after the presentation portion is complete. If you can use your raise your hand button, that would be helpful. NASDAQ hopes you leave this event invigorated and with new ideas to help you do your work. We ask that you take time to complete a short feedback survey using the link provided at the end of the presentation. The survey will help us continuously improve our events and it also helps fulfill our SAMHSA website obligations. And we provide them with essential data that's required by our contract. Please note all information will be confidential and we will respect your privacy. We do not offer CEU credits for our events, but you will receive a certificate of attendance after the survey is completed. And that certificate you can use if you're ever applying for your family peer um, national certification or if you need to prove that you've been in any training, that certificate is very useful for those ideas. I would also like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today. And thank you all for joining us. At this time, I would like to introduce NASDAQ's project manager for this series. Oh, I forgot we added one extra thing in now. We had a lot of questions about what is technical assistance and what does NASDAQ offer? So let me quickly go over that. We offer information. For instance, you can look at our website or look at the newsletters. We offer trainings like we are doing today, both virtual. And if you go to the national conference, we have a three hour training usually, or sometimes four hour training at the conference in person. We have resources and product developments, which means you could go to a very large resource library on the NASDAQ webpage and you know, typing what you're looking for and hopefully you'll get it. We also have a lot of products on that front page. We have workforce development. We help any family-run organization, any family peer specialist, anyone who works to support families and youth with mental health and or substance use. So feel free to um, contact us with any questions. And technical assistance. We often get a question, what exactly is technical assistance? Well, Technical assistance is a fancy way for us to say if you have a question or you need our support and you want individual information, 
see that orange button here that says request technical assistance on our web page click that button fill out a form and we will get back to you and we'll talk to you and see how we can help next we're always trauma responsive. We're strengths based. We avoid blaming caregivers, one of my favorites. We're always inclusive. We use person first language. We're respectful, non judgmental, and we're consistent with our actions. And that's called family driven language. Dana? Thank you, Gail. Um, so we are excited to have you here today for this special office hours series. Um, like Gail mentioned, this is really geared towards supporting the family peer workforce. And we hope by the end of this series, we've given you some training that will help you to transform systems so that we can have more authentic family partnerships. So the goals of our series are to support family peers to build score skills within the five core competencies to best support families. We also hope that this series inspires you to challenge family serving systems by advocating for family driven approaches. And we hope that you get some resources, tools and opportunities for peer learning to increase um, your own competence within the four five core competencies. So we've had um, a wonderful session on wellness and resiliency with Wanda Douglas that's on our YouTube page. We had a great session with Barbara Callahan about affecting change for resources and natural supports. We had some speakers for my, from my kid who talked about all of the great things that that organization does. And we had two sessions on systems knowledge and navigation. We had a few folks from who have expertise in various systems come and talk. And then we had a special session on transition age youth in May. We're going to have a wonderful session with Tavo Sastre about cultural congruence. And then in June, we will close out our series with um, Nikki Howenstein, a state recovery director, talking about confidentiality, boundaries, and ethics. So we're very excited um, for all of these wonderful sessions and hope you can join us for all of them or visit our YouTube page or the NAFSAC events page to get the slides and recordings. For today's office hour, we hope that you leave this session understanding how promoting acceptance can help buffer against family peer drift. We also hope you will learn why family peer drift is a social justice issue, gain some tools and strategies to address and buffer against that peer drift, and learn about the distinct roles and lived experience of family, youth, and adult peers. So first, let's start out and get to know what you think peer drift is. And there is no wrong answer. You can just type in whatever you think peer drift means. Um, there is a link in the chat. You can also go to www.menti.com and use that code on screen, 1230-4338, um, or use that single link that Lachelle has put into the chat and type a couple of words or a sentence about what you think peer drift is. And it's okay if your answer is, I don't know. That's all right too. And if you're having trouble accessing the Mentimeter, you can also type it in the chat like and Ferguson, moving outside of the role of peer, giving advice. See, we've got some responses coming in. Cheap labor, peer-driven care, moving away from the role of a peer support into another role, no idea, becoming too clinical, giving away from core values or principles of peer-driven care when peers drifting out, peer workers adopting a clinical culture, getting away from the peer role toward clinical role, talking like a therapist or clinician. Great. We'll keep on sharing those thoughts and we'll share all of them with you along with the slideshow at the close of the presentation in a couple of days. So I'm going to pass it and over I to Gail, who's going to introduce herself and take it away. I wanted to point out one that was in there and it was not feeling comfortable with their own role. That's really important too. But 
I wanted to introduce myself because I wanted to let you know why I understand what peer drift is. I have been a supervisor of care coordinators, case managers, and very fortunate to say I've been a supervisor of family peer specialists, not in my, not only in my own company, but when I was the executive director of the state family org in North Carolina, I oversaw my staff of family peer specialists, but I also played the role as a mentor and, and semi-supervisor informally to many, many family peer specialists throughout the state. So I understand all sides of roles. And I have to say, case managers, care coordinators, and family peer specialists all are important to supporting families. So no role is more important to others, but I am partial to the family peer specialist. So next slide, please. So what is family peer drift? Well, I saw in the chat, most of you were very late and I saw a little bit of frustration in there too. And you have a right to have some frustration in there because we really do need to keep the role of family peer specialist authentic. And why is that? Next slide. Family peers, the role of peer specialist is now an evidence-based practice. And family peers in any evidence-based practice should be kept pure. It, and if we're not authentic to the task, we're not authentic to the role, and we will not see the results that we know we can achieve with the family peer specialist. Peer drift occurs when the peer support provider doesn't feel comfortable in their role, and they begin to shift to a different role, even a more clinical role, in short, a change in role self-perception. I see them because they see me. And, and that's really, really important. And I wanna know, just if you have cameras on, how many people are family peer specialists or have been or have been family leaders? It's good. I see a lot of hands going up. And, and I'm going to speak for myself as well as everybody else. Sometimes when you're sitting in, you know, in that on a table with all these people with suit, suits and ties and many, many degrees, oh, look, we're all, all family peer specialists. It can be a little intimidating. And also, as you start to sit there, and if you're not really prepared, you could start thinking, well, these people are talking a certain way, and they're not talking about their lived experience. They're talking about their degreed experience or their professional experience. Maybe I need to drift over and be a little bit more professional because it begins to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable when you're the person sitting there and you have that expertise, but it doesn't seem to align with everybody. And no one is giving you that perception that they understand either. Next slide, please. When family peer workers act in a role that differs from what is intended, this form of drift occurs when family peer workers task inadvertently take on the characteristics of their colleagues or perceived as a form of other support by parents and caregivers with whom they work. So basically we're drifting over to other people's roles because that seems to be the culture and it makes you feel more comfortable. And I've done it myself. You have been employed, a really good example would be if you've been employed by a provider agency for some time and you attend staff meetings with clinical staff weekly. Over time, you begin to advocate for the agency's needs rather than advocating for the parent, caregiver, and family needs. And that's particularly interesting. If you're embedded in a company or an organization and you're supposed to be supporting and advocating the family as a family peer specialist, Sometimes your organization may be offering services you know the family doesn't need or want, and the services may not even be person-centered or family-driven. So you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. 
how do you tell the person, your company, your boss, the people who pay your paycheck, that they need to do things a different way? You can be placed in a very uncomfortable situation. Another type of example is you have worked with a parent for nine months and your relationship is very comfortable. You begin to share information about yourself that is really not relevant to the parent caregiver's plans or needs. And this is not a professional role drift, but a personal role drift. And you start drifting over to more family and being familiar with them in a different role. And that that isn't positive either. There, you should have some kind of professional boundaries. But as family peer specialists, we understand our role and our boundaries are a little bit fuzzier than a care manager or a case coordinators. Next slide. Why is it important to understand? Peer support is a proven to be an evidence-based practice. That means we need to really align with those tasks consistently. Peer drift dilutes the effectiveness of peer support. And quite honestly, if we're always drifting away from our role, we're giving other people in the community, other organizations, state people, people we advocate and our colleagues, the wrong idea of what family peer specialist is. And it could actually set the workforce back. You know, we're making so many strides as a family peer specialist as a whole, but because we're a new position, relatively new position, at least in the eyes of our funders, we have to make sure we really hold firm to our role to, to actually be able to expand family peer specialists. Am I making sense, guys? If I'm not, I, anyone confused? Good. So how do we detect, next slide, please. A strong sense of role. We have to be comfortable in using our lived experience story as a tool. We have to focus on our strengths and opportunities and skills. We have to feel like a respected member of the workforce and our team that we're working with. And we always have to be person-centered. So how do you detect whether you may be drifting away from your true sense of peer support? Well, we may start feeling a little uncomfortable about sharing lived experience. And, you know, we really promotes strategic sharing. You don't have to share every single thing about your life to every single person. That's not being a family peer specialist. But we do have to draw from our expertise when we're supporting a family to, to connect with that family. Or if we're sitting around an advocacy table to create change in policy, we can draw on certain aspects of our lived experience to really help push that policy, but we don't have to share every single thing. So we have to realize our balance of feeling comfortable about sharing those strategic bits and pieces that would help work in our favor and the families and the family workforce's favor. We should focus on barriers and symptoms. And you know, if you start focusing on barriers and symptoms and clinical diagnosis, maybe you start have to reevaluate if you're drifting away and being too clinical. If you defer decisions and avoid the challenges perceived experts that are non-family members. Remember, you're as much an expert as someone with a PhD who's a psychiatrist or a psychologist. They have their job to do and we have to respect that. But our job is equally as important in a different way. Next slide. So we're gonna have another question. If you could go to Mentimeter and be honest. And Mentimeter is, we cannot tell you who you are. We can't see that, it's anonymous. Have you experienced family peer drift? I see one person, three people. Now, you know, you could experience 
drift you from your own position vote? too. Ooh. If you're the if you hi Billy, what's up? You know, we do, there are drifting from your position in other places. And and actually, I have a little story while we're filling in and voting. I had a care coordinator who really wanted to be a family peer specialist. So she always drifted from her role as care coordinator and became more of a family peer specialist. And we had to always kind of bring her back because that wasn't her role either. And quite frankly, she wasn't a parent. So she couldn't do that role or a primary caregiver. Well, I see it's coming in and I see that everyone like me has experienced family peer drift every once in a while. And that's okay. And it's really important to recognize because then we can pull ourselves back from being drifted because we know if we can recognize it, we can stop it. Next slide, please. So, Avoiding family peer drift. The best practice is to have a family-run organization overseeing training, peer supervision, and regular connections. And if you go to our Federation of Family site, you can see where all the state family-run organizations and all the affiliates that are associated with the Federation of Families are. As you know, an affiliate of the National Federation of Families is a family-run organization. So if you are fortunate to have one in your state, the best place to get your training is at that organization. The best training for family peer specialists are from other family peer specialists. But if you happen to have been hired, next, next slide, please. If you happen to be hired by a not family run organization, and like a hospital or a school or a community mental health center, and you're not in a family run organization, it's good to convince you're gonna need that training and you still need training. And you should ask your supervisors and your colleagues about where you can get training that is really created and supported from family run organizations with family voice. All foundation training, for family peer specialists should really be done by recognized family peers with lived experience. There are many there available family trainers with, the, with lived experience and trainings available. There are national trainings, statewide trainings, and local trainings. So you ask your local state organization or even your own employer where you can get that. You can always come to the National Federation of Families and to NAS. Stack. And you know that little TA button I told you about? You can always fill that out and we can help you either connect you with training in your area or we can point you into some virtual training. And just as a side note, NASTAC, this technical assistance center is putting the final touches on a curriculum for family peer specialists. It's a one-on-one -on -one curriculum, family peer specialists across the lifespan. So how you can train um, parent, you know, family peer specialists who support young families to right across the lifespan and support a, a mother who's supporting their 40 year old. So hopefully that should be available and it's online and it'll be free. I'll let you know a little bit about that later. Next slide. Also hiring. There were five factors of support to address family peer specialists. First there's training, but next it's hiring. And we should be able to really look at how we hire. We should create, hopefully, the best practice would be that we would hire a team that included clinical supervisors, colleagues, directors, individuals, both community members who are getting family peer specialist support from that organization and from family peer specialists themselves. And these are the people who can evaluate, evaluate how comfortable the pros, prospective family peer specialist candidate is with discussing their personal journey reference handout. Um, there are, I should reference a lot of the handouts here that I have in the chat. 
there's a handout on questions you can ask a potential family peer specialist. So these are really, really the questions and how you set up in hiring a family peer specialist. And it's important because if you're hiring a family peer specialist, A, your organization needs to understand the real role of a family peer specialist and not dilute it. But they also have to realize that who they're hiring feels comfortable telling their own journey, having their own journey and telling their story and feels and understands their role. So there's a great need for both the employer and the employee who's a family peer specialist to really understand their roles. How do they understand their roles? Training, training, training. And there's training even, there was training to um, do for employers. Employers could take some trainings about how to understand the role of family peer specialists. And of course, family peer specialists can understand, take their training to understand their own role. Next. This is extremely important, supervision. Now, I do believe you need supervision. Clinical supervision is important, but it's not the deciding factor. Next, next slide, please. Clinical focuses on case studies, intervention strategies, diagnosis, programmatic and organizational norms. But what's really, really important is weekly, regular, peer supervision from someone else who has lived experience. I think that's extremely important to have a supervisor who has walked the walk as a peer. Um, clinical, a lot of times you can set up your organization to have um, group clinical sessions or maybe have clinical supervision once a month, but you really do need that regular peer-to-peer -peer supervision as well. And that will eliminate a lot of peer drift. And, you know, access to many, many types of supervision is important. And it also establishes a workplace norm. Let's go to the next slide. Fourth, creating opportunities in the field. Let's face it, if you're a family peer specialist, and you're always a direct, a direct worker, a direct care. Yeah, you may love it, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I love people who love to be in the field, hands-on as a family peer specialist. But some of us want to see what's, and it's very, very normal. How do we move up in the ladder? How do we become a family peer supervisor? I think organizations miss the opportunity of creating opportunities in this field that as a family peer specialist, we need to look to see, well, what do you want to be in five years? Do I want to do direct service? It's okay if you do, but maybe you want to become a supervisor or a manager, or you want to be an executive director of a family-run organization. All of those are achievable, and all of them should have a pathway in your field. And through your current employment, they should talk about that. You know, you should have a a plan of action of what you want to become as you move on. You should have that professional development plan. You should get excited about it. You should have an annual review. As scary as that is, folks need to know, you need to know if you're doing this right. And of course, always, I would hope every supervisor, every organization is strength-based and bases has the strength-based performance routines. Next, please. And of course, the acceptance factor. What does that mean? That means that when you're sitting around that table and you're talking to your peers or you're doing a group clinical supervision and you offer your suggestions and your ideas that you're all looked upon as an equal teammate in your company, in your organization, at different meetings. That's the acceptance factor. If you don't have that acceptance factor from your colleagues, your peers, the people in the community, you're not going to feel accepted and you're going to be so tempted to drift away from that, that role that you're supposed to have. And it's such an important role. And one really important thing, next slide. 
acceptance factor also includes regular connections with other family peers. Now, the National Federation of Families has their national conference that happens every November and this year in Orlando, which is fun. But it's a place where you can connect not only with those in your organizations, but your fellow peers. When I was um, the executive director of North Carolina, Families United, I would host the state family peer specialist meeting every quarter. So family peers from all organizations could come together and just never, you know, really connect and network and talk about, yeah, that's happening to me. There were all kinds of ways to do connections. Even here, coming to this meeting is another way of networking and meeting your colleagues just by seeing people's names here. So networking with other family peers expands and strengthens and strengthens our conviction of really staying in our field and being aligned. So that's what family peer specialists are. Next page. Um, we are gonna go into a breakout session. And I think we're gonna break out into three groups, Dana, is that correct? That is correct. And, and what we're gonna do is we'll have a facilitator and we have 20 minutes in the group. But we're gonna answer these two questions. How can family peers who recognize drift find a voice when supervisors are asking them to take on roles that are outside the scope of their family peer role? I will tell you that's the number one question we always get. What questions should a family peer specialist ask at a job interview to prevent peer drift and better understand the organization's investment in maintaining a family peer's authenticity? We're gonna have 20 minutes to do this. You will have a facilitator. And I want you all to throw in your ideas because we're going to talk about it and we're going to answer a lot of questions when we come back. And Gail, we forgot to include our lovely community agreement slide, but if you want to talk about um, sharing space for a moment, that might be helpful. Ah, forgot our community agreement. Um, obviously, when we're going to ask that if you take a breath and if you talk once, if you can wait to let two other people talk and ask questions before you jump in again. So we can kind of give everybody an, a, a, an opening to speak up and ask questions. And of course, what says here, we are recording this, but the breakout rooms will not be recorded, but we'll do the Vegas rule. What is said there stays there and you know we'll respect everybody's privacy. All right, and I'm gonna, you're, you'll hear my voice coming into your room to give you a few time reminders as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the breakout rooms. And if you have any technical issues, just come back to the main room and I'll get you where you need to be. Well, I don't know about the other groups, but our group had a great conversation and I would love, love, love to hear from everybody else. So on our first question, which was, how can family peers who recognize drift find a voice when supervisors are asking them to take on roles that are outside the scope of the family peer role? Does anyone want to kind of read out in their group? Sure, Gail, I can. Um, we had a couple of really good, um, well, actually we had several good um, suggestions, but um, I really liked, um, Amanda had talked about that her company where she works um, has hired a, a navigator, a third party, so that when issues come up um, in terms of what they're doing in their roles or their jobs, they actually can go to this third party, this navigator, and that navigator then becomes the, um, essentially they carry the message whether it's HR or supervisors, which I thought was You're brilliant. Right. Yeah. Um, and Ashley also, do you want me to keep going? I can run through ours. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
Ashley is in the state of Louisiana, and one of her recommendations is, is if you're looking at, um, you know, in terms of how you're working in terms of the drift, um, look at the data that you have and let that data empower you, um, when, especially when you go in to talk to supervisors, um, because they also look at information and that way you can show them what the outputs are of that data and let them know what your roles are. Um, and then Gail, this one's probably going to be yours and Dana's favorites, but um, it was suggested that people also go to NASDAQ where we do training or coaching and that if you need help in terms of dealing with peer drift, um, you can come to us and we can work with you on that. Oh, I do like that one. I thought you were. Lichelle? Yeah, we also had a very interactive group and I'm going to um, kind of paraphrase exactly what we were said, said. We had two individuals say that for the most part, to be able to hold your ground and say, I have a caseload of my own, and this is kind of a little bit too much for me to take on at this point, right? So if they're trying to give them additional um, additional responsibilities, just say, you know, I have a caseload that I'm working on, and it's kind of out of my scope to do that. Um, another, another feedback was that, um, well, I think we did more around the interviews, like the interview questions. We had a little bit more responses to interview questions, or those were the ones that I actually wrote down. So, <laughs> I know there, the was, there was a lot of comments in my group too. Um, Barbara, are you still here? Help me out with answering some, or Michelle or Maria, if you're here, feel free to jump in. But when we were talking about how to stay in that role, one really good suggestion was to have the family peer specialist um, do an in-service for their org organization on what they do and how they do it and why their role may look a little different than a care coordinator's or a case manager's role and, and really do that in-service. So I thought that was good. Anyone from and my team? And I was going to call um, Brandy, who was in our group. I think you work for Face Faces, and she has. She has sounds it, like she has a fact. lot of. Fact. Sorry, it's fact. Family advocacy fact. and community training. Sorry. Thank you. Would you like to share some of that? Because it sounds like your organization has a lot of support for family peers. Um, they do. So we have like. We have uh, several supervisors. When I first started four years ago, over four years ago, um, there was only like 37 of us. And now there's like 55 of us now. Um, so we have supervisors and then we have a couple of managers, but then we have mentors. So someone that's been there for at least two to four years, like myself, um, can mentor somebody. And if they're having issues or they have questions or anything going on, then that mentor steers them in a good direction. This frees up the supervisor with like the non-serious kind of stuff. Um, and it also helps keep everybody in check with themselves as well, because it's, it's, it's a back and forth. Also, um, our executive director meets with us yearly to see if there's any changes or if there's anything going on that we would like or dislike about our jobs. Um, and then we have, um, you know, meetings at least once a month with my team, with my supervisor, and then I can call my supervisor anytime. So we have a really, really good family type community within our organization. Well, that's no. great. And, and what state are you in, Brandy? Uh, Missouri. We uh, we're awesome. closest to St. Louis. Okay, okay. And then I'm just going to call on one more person, not to take over, but I like what Doretta had to say because she plays various roles in her um, organization. Doretta, do you feel comfortable coming on camera and sharing some of what you shared? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we're families inspiring families, and in, uh, we're now Region Five and Region Six. And so um, I am, um, I have different roles. I'm deputy director, however, I'm still an advocate. And so I feel like one of my roles is to make sure that my advocates 
um, you know, I'm constantly trying to figure out like, hey, um, what can we do as far as self-care? What can we do? We actually had a retreat yesterday um, to try and do some team buildings and whatnot. But I was telling her that we have a structured, um, initially on Mondays, um, once a month, we used to do a support group with our families. However, since COVID, it's gone to every Monday between five and six o'clock over Zoom. And sometimes, you know, when we don't have parents that come on, our advocates come on and, you know, we, we, we try and support each other as much as possible because, you know, I've been doing this, I've been in the field since 2004, this capacity since 2016. And it is hard to find that, that, uh, that line between mm -hmm. it's just too much because we're dealing with you know, families and they're going to crisis. We have our own families that go through crisis. We have our own lives and it's trying to help each other kind of balance that out. And, you know, you have to have, your, if you're constantly having things um, poured out of you, you have to have things poured into you. Um, and so that's what we try and really, really do. Cause this is, this work is not easy at all. <laughs> so no, that's no. kind of one of the things that we do. Thank you. That, that is really good. Thank you, Lachelle. Let's go to the next question. And that is, what question should a family peer specialist ask at a job interview to prevent peer drift and better understand the organization's investment in maintaining a family peer's authenticity? Hey, Gail. Um, we had some great input on that as well. Um, I'm slightly prejudicial about our group, but um, we also had great input on that. Um, but uh, one of the questions was, how do you support your peers? How often is supervision required? Um, and what does the peer support role look like with your company? Um, I also want to see if she doesn't mind, I want to call on Carla Preto um, because she had a great, it's not quite what questions you asked, but what questions what can happen when you look at what the organization is that's about to hire that family peer specialist? Um, oh, that's good. Yeah. So, Carla, would you mind talking about that? Um, she works uh, in an organization in Michigan, the Association for Children's Mental Health, and she is not a family peer specialist. Um, but she talked about how, how critical that supervisor role is to the success of the family peer specialist role. So, Carla, you're there. Thanks, Gina. Um, Thank you. Yes, I, I, so our organization is the training entity for um, our parent support partners and youth peer support specialists in the state of Michigan. And we recognize really the power of supervision and the success of the peer role um, all the time. And so what we added, we have an org readiness doc that we require from the agencies when they're going to send a peer to our training and we've added in questions around what does their supervision look like? How are they planning for it? So that they're thinking ahead to understand that that's really a critical component. That, Kyla, you know, I we work together very closely, Kyla and I, a lot of times, and she's right on target. And, and Chrissy, do you have anything to contribute? I know you always have, Fabulous information. Uh, I, I so agree with the importance of the role with supervision. One thing that I want to ask you at a point, Gail, and this has been on my mind quite a bit with our parent support model, um, is kind of the line between fidelity around strategic sharing and connecting through lived experience and active listening and all of those core components of the role. So the line there and also being able to be like meet the parent where they are in your empowerment pro approach. So some of our families will, uh, family support staff will share, you know, I share information and I share resources and I'm mindful of my boundary between my, my role and the role of the case manager. But I think sometimes it's a bit of a um, delicate dance and also like with coaching around parenting and parenting skills, you know, we're always trying to direct our um, PS parent support workforce to like have the clinician do more of that coaching with the parent um, and they support voice within those models. 
Um, but again, I think it can be a gray area because sometimes they'd like to share some of the skills that they've built and things that they've tried. Um, so it's like that line between connection and also information sharing. Like we, we want to be careful that they're not feeling like they're teaching, but they also have lived experience that they, you know, feel can be valuable when they're, you know, sharing. So curious what you're yeah, thinking. Yeah. Well, fidelity to the role of family peer specialist, and, and you will learn what the fidelity to their role is if you take a solid training a, a very solid family peer 101 training and again like i said look towards your state family runs to really get that training or come to us yeah but you need to stay really straight with the role but the problem is our role is a family peer specialist and i say our i mean i i know i'm no longer a family peer specialist but i feel like i'm part of the group Mm -hmm. It's that balance. It is a real balance between your role is so different than everybody else's role in many of the organizations. You have to share things that a lot of people don't have to share, but you also have to know when to pull back and when to, and to really do that balancing act. And that takes experience, mm -hmm. really, really solid supervision. Mm -hmm training and everybody around you in support and looking at you like an equal team member. So Chrissy, you, you said it really well. It's it's that answer, that that solid piece. I see Stephanie has had her hand up for a long time here. Stephanie. Uh, no, I just raised it. If someone else has theirs up no. first. Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, this is really fascinating because here in Idaho, some of what you're talking about is not the way it's done. And um, like, for example, in our standards for, we call them certified family support partners. So in our standards at act teaching is one thing we are expected to do because clinicians either don't want to do it or they can't bill for it. Or, you know, there's some reason that, that, that psychoeducation is not happening. And it, and it does come up when you're sitting there with the, I'm going to say mom, because that's mostly who I met with. Um, when you're sitting there with the mom and she truly wants information. Okay, so, so that is one thing. Another thing is, in our state, our state-run organization is not in charge of training for family support. Um, it is it is put out as you you have to now be a um, proprietary school in order to teach to train family support partners. Another thing is we are enmeshed with the adult side of peer support, and that so doesn't work because the supervision I would receive weekly was with peer specialists who work with adults. So the things I would get from them were maybe some good resources for a family, like a food pantry or something. But then I was the only family support partner and the things I'm sharing, they, you know, they're sitting there with the, like a deer in the headlights look because I'm talking children's mental health, which is very different from adult mental health. So this is fascinating because I'm seeing so many things that we need to correct. Um, and I'm not sure how to go about correcting. Well, well let's pass this out. I see three different questions. So I'm, I'm going and everybody take your mics off. You can help because as I said before, I'm not the keeper of all the answers. So feel free to correct me or jump in and help. But first, teaching. You said that wasn't a role for the family peer specialist. It actually is depending on what you mean. What do you mean yes, by- Yes, I'm teaching? saying it is a role. Okay, and it is, it's a role. It, you know, we teach, we sometimes have to educate in a very, you know, person-centered, family-driven way. We just don't say, okay, we're going to teach you how to take care of your child and teach your child how to do homework. That's not what we'll, we'll teach. We teach, if a parent says, I don't understand the juvenile justice system and what do I do for court? 
and you teach them, well, this is what's going to happen, or you role play with them, or you kind of go over the rules or the forms, that kind of teaching is definitely in the scope of work and fidelity to a family peer specialist. The next thing you talked about was training. And I would be curious of where did you get the training and who developed that training? Were there family members with family peer a voice that developed the training. It doesn't have to be a family-run organization. If folks got together, I mean, before I came to the state of North Carolina, the UNCG, a university, brought together family members to develop the training. So it was housed in a university, but family members made the training. Who made your training? Stephanie, okay, know? it's a it's a long story. I'll try to make it short. It started off with a contract with the state uh, family family led organization, but then that contract was pulled be because apparently money wasn't there. So um, the the state just sat on that curriculum, and then. Um, and then it was just put out to the, the community. Anybody want to do our trainings? Check off this checklist and sign your name to it. And, and we're now saying you're able to do training. And you had to be, um, at least one trainer has to be a certified family support partner. Um, and then somebody said, oh, you're going against the law. The law states if people are getting certifications for jobs, you must be a proprietary school in our state. And they claim that that's true. That's the law in, all, in most states. So, you know, it get, you get to a point where, and I used to be a trainer. For three years, I was the only trainer in the state. But then they came up with all this proprietary school stuff. So, so now we have one trainer again, and it is a mental health agency that is doing it. Okay. Well, I'm going to be really clear and you can like, my voice is recorded on this. So I'll be really clear. Best practice. And, and the only way you're going to prevent peer drift and keep to the fidelity of a family peer model is to have that training developed with family lived experience voice. And those trainers should be people who've been in the field, who've experienced this, or who have lived experience and who can train that. And that's fidelity. Um, it, we are coming out with a virtual training that maybe could supplement whatever, you know, whatever training they do that will help you and will help you get the national certification. But that's, that's another conversation. The last thing I wanted to hit was the peer support. There is a role for everybody. And yeah, we all know we all need as much support and as much workers in this field to support families, youth, peers, adults, everyone. So there is a great role and I have great respect for family peer recovery special. I mean, for peer recovery specialists. But it's peer to peer, the adult to the adult. That person, the peer recovery specialist, supports the adult peer doing adult things. A family peer specialist supports a parent or primary caregiver or family member who's caring for a child of any age. How to navigate the system. Getting supervision from a peer recovery specialist would be like getting supervision from an electrical engineer to do your family peer specialist job. There's two different roles and you know they may they're great probably to help you with resources. I think that's a fabulous because both of you should know resources and that could be overlapping, but that shouldn't be your supervisor. Brandy, you're next. I was I was typing it out because I wasn't sure how much time we had left, but um so fact, my organization, they we we provide peer support to parents or caregivers of those with disabilities, regardless, you know, if it's a developmental disability or physical disability, 
but FACT only hires people with the live experience. So you have to be a caregiver or a parent of someone with a disability. Like for example, my son, he's almost 22 now, but um, he's been diagnosed with autism since he was six. So that's what opened the door and we found them. So anybody that wants, like they have to have that in order to be able to cater to be the peer. Yeah, that's perfect. I'd like to work in your state. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Um, just really quick, I, I love my job. I absolutely love being a peer and, and I tell everybody and I'm very honest when I first meet them that I really wish I would have had peer support when my son was young. And I just want to let everybody know that you really do make a difference. People really do care. They, It's almost like a breath of fresh air to know that they're not the only one going through this. So I just I just think it's great. Yeah, uh, and I, I agree with the question in the chat here. It says, Brandy, you don't look like you're old enough to have a 22 year old. Um, We didn't, we still have some time, so Rochelle and Gina, do you have any other, what What did your team talk about with what questions you should ask for family peer specialist? Any other information? Yeah, we had a couple of people who had said, they asked about kind of what we talked about already, what the supervision looked like. Also, uh, we had the comment of what does your cross training look like? You know what I mean? Like, do you want to have a mentor for me to make sure that I know exactly what my job is and I can see the role happen in real life, right? Um, also, of course, just to see what are what are the what is the job description? What is the written description of what your expectations of a family peer peer are? And then um, a good a good question was was like how would you handle the, they would ask the um, interviewer how would you handle I'm sorry my long guys off the hook you can't hear them um, how would you handle if I was in a hold on no we're not we can't hear anything Michelle oh you can't okay it's just me so it's basically how would you handle if I was in a situation that I could not emotionally handle. Ooh, that's a deep one. I would love to hear an answer or a thought from someone we haven't heard from. Anybody? If you're uncomfortable, I would, I would, like us, we have mentors. So I would reach out to my mentor in I don't know, COVID had some perks so we can do virtual. If you don't, if you don't feel comfortable with them, you could always have your supervisor come on and come with you and kind of like lead it a little bit just to see what happens, whether it be like a conflict of interest or, or, you know, you met them and you don't like them as a person, you know, because their kid goes to school with your kiddo, you know, it's, it, it could be just about anything, but I always utilize our our mentors and, and uh, or my coworkers, my other um, teammates and my supervisor. Yeah, and those are good, good answers. Paula, do you have any thoughts? I missed the crux of it. Was it enjoy in meeting with a family that there are some concerns around? That, that if you're working with a family that kind of triggers you, Oh. How is your employer or your supervisor going to support that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually have to discuss this um, <laughs> somewhat regularly with supervisors and around different situations that arise. I mean, number one, you need to think about, in my opinion, is the safety aspect. Is there a safety concern somewhere? Um, and Next is, is it appropriate to have a peer referral? So those two really need to be addressed to understand, like, is this appropriate for the peer or has a peer just been dumped in like the kitchen sink because we're going to just throw everything at it, right? Um, to try to help this family. If both of those things are um, like not at a level where you wouldn't be appropriate to be helping this family, then 
usually what we say is let's strategize around, can you go to meet the family together in groups, right? So um, is there a therapist that's going out that's home-based for the child? Um, and then you meet with a parent or vice versa, whatever type of peer you are, um, so that you're not alone. Can you meet out in the community so that you're not maybe secluded in the home? Um, uh -huh. and, and then if it's something that's triggering you personally, um, I think that's where you really need to take advantage of your supervision and building up that relationship because it's something that they can and should help support you through because the reality is we all come with our own lived experience and that looks different than the workforce in other organizations. We for sure have things we've dealt with and that can look very different when we're asking of folks to go out and then put yourself in situations that are difficult. You are inevitably going to be facing hardships. So that has to be a component that you can talk through with your supervisors. Thank you, Carla. And Gina, you have one wrap up one, right? Yes, Gail, it's another one you're gonna like. And Dana. Okay. Um, this is from Sarah. And her suggestion too was that the Federation has offers family peer certification um, and it can add quote letters after your name unquote. It adds validity to your profession. Most states have certification as well. Having both certifications can add an extra touch. And I agree that we shouldn't need letters about our after our experience and edu our education experience should be enough been in a room full of people with degrees and letters, we can become, quote, just the parent because of an outdated thought process, but still prevalent. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I think that's a great way to wrap up. And we're all family leaders. And you're a leader if you're a family peer specialist or a family run executive director. We're all family leaders here. And we became family leaders because of our family lived experience. So it's okay to be triggered and but to understand that too. So coming in May, we have office hours, same time, same channel. I feel like uh, every um, Tuesday, once a month. And on Tuesday, May 14th, during uh, Mental Health Acceptance Month, our next one will be held with an executive director, Tavo Sastry. He's from Reach Family Services, and he's gonna really talk about the professional responsibilities and cultural congruence. And I think it's gonna be a great, great conversation. And I'd love everyone to make sure, be, when you join us, be prepared to be conversational. We want to hear you, we want you to talk. So it'll be great. Um, next. Coming up soon is a SAMHSA sponsored website. And you've heard me say person centered a couple of times today. So person centered, family driven, mental health and substance use support, a path towards equity. And this goes along with National Federation of Families and NASDAQ really believes in social justice and obtaining social, social justice, justice means that we have to have a path towards equity and how do you get to equity? By being person-centered and family-driven and listening to our families and our community. So this training is coming up on, what day is this? April 23rd, we'll have a series each month. Look on our website in the calendar and you can get all this information. Next slide. And of course, if you saw anything today that concerned you or you wanted to further talk about it, tell me. I have the info at nasdaq.org will come directly to me. You can email Michelle or Dana or Gina. Um, their emails aren't here, but their emails are set up just like Dana's, which is their first name and first initial and last name plus at ffcmh.org. Always give us feedback. I really, really want your feedback. Here's the QR code if you want to do that. But you can also, as you exit here, the surveys will come right up. And I need you to answer those surveys. They're very helpful. They fulfill our SAMHSA obligation. Um, so it tells us what we're doing right and what we can do better. Feel free to tell me what we can do better. That's always very, very helpful because we only can get better if you tell us. 
Um, again, we'll keep the website up for a few minutes just so you can exit on your own to be taken to the survey. It's a lot easier if you take get taken to the survey when you leave on your own than when I cancel up the Zoom and then you have to go find the link. We will send a follow-up email with all the information we talked about today. So you're more than welcome to wait to then, but I would prefer you leave on your own and fill out the survey. Any other questions before we leave? This is your last one minute opportunity. By a show of hands, how many people think they learned something more about peer drift today? I see Kimberly and Carla and Dorita and Teresa. Oh, good. Karen and Diane and Peggy. This is great. I'm glad. And, and Chrissy, I am so glad you were here to join me on this very important discussion. I'll see you next month.